Well, this one's certainly been a long time coming. I may have considered playing on Maddening Difficulty, if it existed when I started this challenge. Maybe next time. Well, it's next time. And with the recent release of Fire Emblem Engage, I figured now would be as good a time as any to wrap up this challenge that I started in November of 2020? Well, uh, anyway, is it possible to beat Fire Emblem Three Houses while only using bows? The rules for this challenge are relatively simple. Basically, we cannot use anything equipped to the weapon slot save for bows. That means no swords, no lances, no axes, no gauntlets, not even the unarmed attacks that technically aren't a weapon, but I'm considering gauntlets for the purpose of this challenge, no magic attacks, or even any utility or healing magic. Since while those aren't often equipped to the weapon slot, they certainly can be, and therefore we can't use them. Some of the things we can use include battalions, gambits, divine pulse, consumable items, and things equipped to the secondary slot like shields and rings. Oh, and bows too. Obviously we can use those. If we can get from this game start all the way to the credits while keeping to these rules, then that'll be a success in my book. Now let's get started as Mail Byleth on Maddening Difficulty. After an interesting dream, we find ourselves accosted by some bandits hunting down these poor, defenseless children. But all they look like to me is target practice. Unfortunately, between the four of us, there's only one bow to go around. No matter, as Claude and myself can toss the bow around, exchanging it between us as we try to stick to the forest to get the upper hand on these bandits. Although even with such a tactic, it soon becomes clear that we'll soon be overrun. This is where Edelgard bravely stepped up, throwing herself unarmed between myself and the bandits, thus preserving my life. Dimitri also decided to take part in the battle, joining Claude and I in our bow exchange. Ultimately, the battle is won. I return Edelgard's favor to her, and next thing you know, I've been invited to teach archery at Garrig Moth Monastery. I selected the Golden Deer House to teach, as they seem to have the most promising archery students, like Claude, Leonie, and Ignatz. And before I'd even settled into my new job, it was time for a mock battle. I brought myself, Claude, Hilda, Leone, and Ignatz into the battle. Unfortunately, we only had three bows to go around between the five of us, and no, we couldn't access the marketplace yet, so don't suggest that we buy new ones. We can't. Now that being said, I did have a pretty good thing going using the southern forest for cover, while ganging up on Ferdinand to ensure he was eliminated without getting the opportunity to attack himself. Throughout this process, it was important to be cognizant of the other unit's attack ranges, as well as making good use of curve shots to get an extra range on Claude and Ignatz's bow attacks, to then set up a pass to someone without a curved shot, that way we could get more attacks in on each turn. And after all that careful thought and consideration, Hubert landed a 3% crit chance on me. So, uh, yeah, that, that was good. On the next attempt, I used the exact same strategy. But get this, Hubert didn't land a 3% crit chance on me. Hubert was then effectively soloed by Byleth. Ash proved annoying because he could actually counterattack my attacks, but he couldn't counterattack curved shots, so we used those against him primarily. Next, we had to best Edelgard and Dorothea, who were holed up in a defensive position in a forest. Shooting at them in the forest was not a particularly viable option, given how great their avoid chance was. What was viable was one at a time luring them out of their defensive position to then sick the whole crew on them. Then we dealt with Manuela easily. Now we had to deal with the rest of the Blue Lions. Luckily, they made our job a bit easier by getting Dimitri isolated from the rest of the group during their advance, where we were able to pick him off. Then we were facing down Mercedes and Dudu, Dudu being the scarier of the two. He could hit hard and had defense so good that there was really no way we could take him out in a single turn. 
This was unfortunate as that has been our main strategy with most of the melee dudes we've faced thus far, of just trying to attack them and kill them before they even get a chance to attack. So instead, I led the army in a retreat to the more defensible eastern forest. There, Dudu had trouble even hitting us. And there, we whittled down his health and took out Mercedes. That just left Hanuman, who went down easily, and with that, the mock battle was concluded with the Golden Deer emerging victorious. The following month, we purchased enough bows for everyone to have at least one. I also took a look at the students' lesson plans and fundamentally changed them. They're all learning archery, but the second skills they're learning do differ. Lorenz, Ignatz, and Leone are learning lances in addition to archery to eventually prepare them for becoming bow knights in like five years. But you know, you, you gotta plan for the future, delayed gratification and all. Marianne is also on that track, but is currently learning riding at the moment, as I'm waiting for her hidden talents for lances to bloom before I set that as her scheduled lesson plan. Claude and Lysithia are learning authority because, well, quite frankly, someone has to be proficient with gambits if we're going to stand any chance of taking down armored foes in the future. And it might as well be them. And finally, Hilda and Raphael are learning axes. And I honestly couldn't tell you why. Uh, keep in mind, as I'm writing the script, I played this part of the game, and therefore made these decisions like, two years ago? So I have no idea what I was thinking having them learn axes. I'll be honest, looking at it now, it just objectively looks like the wrong play. Perhaps I was hoping to induct them into the fighter class quicker by working axes with them? But really, I have no idea. Now, in addition to training my own class, I also had my heart set on poaching some promising students from the other classes. It's like they always say, go to war with the army you want, not the army you have. Specifically, I've got my eye on the following students as potential recruits. Bernadetta, Petra, Felix, Ash, and Mercedes. Luckily, most of them find skills that I was going to train anyway, like bow, riding, and lance to be attractive. The odd one out is Felix, who would prefer for me to be proficient in swords. Additionally, they all have different stats they appreciate in a teacher. Bernie likes strength, Petra dexterity, Felix speed, Ash charm, and Mercedes magic. As such, I'll be using basically all stat boosting items on myself until I've recruited these five warriors. And of course, I'll be inviting them to dinner and the like to get a bit closer with them. But for now, I've got to use the army I have to hunt down some bandits in the Red Canyon. And as it turns out, they suck. Not the bandits, my army, they're terrible. For starters, no one has close counter yet, which means that unless they're wielding a mini bow, if a melee unit attacks them, they just sit there and take it. Additionally, many of them don't even have curved shot yet, so they can't attack from more than two spaces away, nor can they get the incredible accuracy bonus which curved shot grants. Added on top of that is the fact that most of them are total weaklings, hitting for like four, five, maybe six damage on a given attack. Even just crossing this first bridge was a considerable challenge, not made any easier by the fact that these thieves have the skill pass, meaning you can't even set up much of a bottleneck because they can just pass straight through hostile units. You can work against this by effectively denying the enemies any spaces on the opposite side of your front line by packing everyone together, but that ends up making things annoying on the next turn because now your own units are blocking each other when you're trying to shuffle them around to get in your counterattacks. However, as annoying as it may be, it does prove to be the best strategy. But things don't get any easier once you've crossed the bridge. The issue is that our little formation we came up with for the bridge only really works on the bridge. To bring our army onto a more open plane would be to expose our weaker units to assaults from our enemies. So we don't. Instead, we use our strong units to aggro and then lure our enemies back to the bridge where we're more comfortable. And then once we pincushion them there, we obviously advance onto the now fairly safe plateau and then accidentally select for Lysithia to use magic on an enemy combatants. Drats! Guess we'll uh, start the mission over now. Okay, so after fighting back to about the same place, I opted to have the whole army advance up the western path of the battlefield. Claude and Hilda cleared the way by attracting the attention of the enemy combatants stationed there before leading them into an ambush laid by the rest of the army. From there, we took up defensive positions to repel the rest of the bandit army, which had scrambled to meet us, before finally attacking Costas, who after taking fire from more than half of the army, finally fell. 
thus ending our first real mission. In the following month, I recruited the Merchant Anna to our cause, as well as fixed Hilda and Raphael's training regiments. Hilda has joined the Lance crew, while Raphael is only learning bow, as without that dedicated focus, he will surely fall behind in this skill, which he has zero aptitude for. But on the plus side, some of my students with actual talent have learned close counter, which will surely be quite beneficial in the upcoming battle. Speaking of which, the next battle goes quite a bit more smoothly than the prior one. And I do think the close counters contributed significantly to this fact. We can now advance with some of our sturdier units, attacking with an iron or steel bow, and still have them retaliate when they get attacked on the enemy's turn. On the other end of the spectrum, Lysithia and Marianne are still pathetically weak. Honestly, they're probably on the bubble to be benched when we start recruiting new characters. The fog did complicate things a bit, but ultimately you've just got to advance slowly and cautiously with your best units at the front to prevail. At the Goddess's Rite of Rebirth, things also go decently well. As it turns out, a great way to reduce difficulty in a chapter that normally intends for you to split your army is to not split your army. Things did not go well at the Tower of Black Winds. This is because Gilbert, tactical mastermind that he is, Attracted the ire of basically the entire tower's army at once. Ultimately, there were simply too many of them to repel, and our entire army just got completely overrun. On my second attempt, I solved that issue by not dispatching a rear guard to help Gilbert uh, when the enemy reinforcements approached from behind, thus ensuring he would perish before he got the opportunity to do anything stupid. Once Gilbert was out of the picture, then I sent him the rear guard. That's not to say our troubles ended there. These reinforcements required some preparation for by securing our squisher units inside a defensive formation, then ensuring that the ambushers fell the very next turn. Though I will note that the armored units we faced in this tower were super annoying to deal with. This is because bows are extremely ineffective against armor. Luckily our gambits were able to fill the gap this time. Before the next mission, Bernadetta decided to join my class. This is especially great as Claude won't be joining us for this mission. We sent the main body of the army west to, with some gambits, defensive formations set up at bottlenecks, and a bit of luck, make steady progress northward. Meanwhile, Byleth led a trio in an advance up the eastern side of the map. Oh, and by the way, we've got Cyril now, just so you know. Towards the end, fighting against some of the mages got a bit dicey, but gambits and Marianne's good res proved sufficient to get through. The next fight awaiting us was the Battle of the Eagle and Lion. But first... Shamir, Catherine, and Flane joined the crew. Obviously Shamir I'm quite excited about having. The other two, uh, not so much. As the Black Eagle and Blue Lion forces clashed in the south, we cleaned up some Black Eagle cavalry and Pegasus Knights up in the north. I'll take a second to note here that, uh, archers are extremely effective against flying units, so the Pegasus Knights, no problem. Felix ended up taking the central hill for the Blue Lions, but Byleth quickly challenged him for the position. Now the Blista was in our possession. Though that didn't stop dealing with armored units from being a pain. Luckily, Edelgard and Petra dealt with quite a few of them for us. Anyway, we had the whole army gang up on Edelgard and then Dimitri, and just like that, victory was ours. Manuela and Hanneman joined up before the next battle. Not that I'm particularly likely to use them, ever. In that next battle, I honestly just sort of rushed Solon personally after he overextended himself. Pretty easy, honestly. The next major event was the White Heron Cup. It was pretty easy for me to decide on a student to compete. Lysithia has by far the worst attack power of anyone in her house, save for perhaps Flane. So I figured, hey, if your attacks are so weak, why not replace them with giving someone else a second turn? After some incredible instruction on my part, Lysithia did in fact win, so now she's a certified dancer. Oh, I also convinced Petra to join my class this month, and had a clandestine conversation with one of those superior soldiers Lysithia would be tasked to help out with her dancing, Leone. I have to say, I think we really hit it off. Now to battle. The cause of sorrow was going all right, until Gerald kept charging straight into his death. On a normal playthrough, I'd just heal him with magic, but obviously that's not an option. I tried Hilda's Gambit to heal him, but that didn't end up working long term. What did work was sending in Shamir to distract and then slay the demonic beast before it got a chance to kill Gerald. 
Which means we were able to get Gerald through the cause of sorrow unharmed. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Really? I suppose I stand corrected. We finally had a couple of snipers going into where the goddess dwells and recruited Felix, though we didn't bring him on this mission. I opted to advance up the western side of the forest, utilizing the tried and true strategy of using a tankier unit like Claude to bait out enemies in a controlled manner, then descending a hail of arrows upon them from the rest of the army. We were then beset from the rear before advancing through the forest, facing demonic beasts along the way, which I honestly wasn't too perturbed by since you can effectively pick which unit of yours they attack. After they were taken care of, Kranya's destruction was inevitable. I worried a bit during the second phase of the battle that Biles might get surrounded and cut off, but that didn't happen, and Ignatz's ward arrows specifically ended up being quite helpful at keeping the mages in check. Dealing with a pair of demonic beasts while fending off attacks from other normal enemies was a bit tricky. This was exasperated by the fact that our limited supply of gamuts had two natural homes in the form of demonic beasts and the armored soldiers. I did learn that while I respect Shamir's abilities as an archer, I do not respect her ability to take a hit. Leone is much better at taking such abuse. Luckily, once everyone started fleeing, getting through to the Flame Emperor was no problem. If you're curious, here's how the teaching was progressing before our last battle of the school year. And boy, was this one interesting. Shamir, Leone, and Marianne took to defending the center from what was in large part a threat of Pegasus Knights. Lawrence, Claude, and Bernadetta worked together to take down winged demonic beasts to the west. Luckily, against our army, adding wings to a demonic beast is really a downgrade. Things became even easier after Shamir defeated Ladislava, and in so doing, softened up the middle assault enough to allow for some resources from the center to be diverted to helping take out the demonic beasts. But the toughest front was by far the eastern front, where Byleth, Petra, Ignatz, Lysithia, and Hilda had to work in concert to hold back the Death Knight, a warrior I'd avoided fighting with directly to this point, and for good reason. Even just one hit from him would spell doom for most of our units. Luckily, using gambits and stairs, we were able to stall him and his posse long enough to get Byleth in position to land a 4% chance critical hit on him. Thank you, Sothis. With the initial assault repelled, it was time to go on the offensive, which the Onagers made quite annoying to effectuate. Fortunately for us, Claude and an allied swordsman were brave enough to risk the enemy fire and seize the siege weapons though that immediately presented us with the new problem of being in range of the ballistas. In particular, advancing on Hubert's position while under such fire proved quite difficult, especially given his heel tile and the winged demonic beasts he was summoning. Randolph took that as his opportunity to flank Claude's troop of the Onager from the opposite direction. Shamir was able to take down Randolph himself with Hunter's Volley, an amazing combat art by the way, while Bernadetta and Claude bought some time to deal with the other threats with Gambits. Meanwhile, Byleth and Lysithia easily eliminated the threat posed by the southeastern ballista before the entire eastern company headed towards the center to help deal with Edelgard's advance. Claude skillfully dodged an attack from her, Leone used an onager to attack her from safe distance without the chance of her counterattacking her, then Byleth made the finishing blow, winning the battle. Well, mostly. <sighs> After awakening from a five-year slumber, the first thing Claude has me do is fight a whole army of ruffians and thugs. Just the two of us. And it was a nightmare. You see, this is a level that severely punishes you if you haven't been keeping your main students from your house on curve with the threats you're facing. That's because you don't get to pick who you bring into this one. You get set units in a set order at set positions. Let's see how it goes. Step one, survive past the first, like, two turns. Easier said than done. After numerous attempts that ended in disaster, here's the strategy that did work. First, you have Byleth go to this forest for extra cover and gamp with the guy next to him to death. Next, you have Claude fly over to Byleth, dismount, and snipe an archer from that forest tile. Being in the forest ought to give you the avoid chance you need to be spared most of the enemy's attacks, and getting a crit off certainly doesn't hurt. Now, maintain that position and just take shots at the incoming foes. Again, critical hits, which luckily Claude is quite adept at landing, help. By the end of the enemy's phase, Bath and Claude thinned out most of their immediate to relevant attackers and the first wave of the back. Finally, Lawrence, Ignatz, Leone, and Hilda arrive. Given that Bath and Claude went south initially, the direction that Hilda and Leone are in, and the fact that, no offense to Lawrence and Ignatz, but Hilda and Leone are just sturdier, better units than the other two, 
It's relatively easier for the girls to tear through foes and reunite with Biles and Claude, while Lawrence and Ignatz just sort of lie low, trying to avoid detection for now. Claude and Biles creep their way up, baiting out the enemies one or two units at a time, with Leone and Hilda helping with the project once they meet up properly with them. Baiting out an archer proves troublesome, but nothing Biles' one remaining gambit can't handle. Additionally, this finally creates the opportunity for Ignatz and Lawrence to strike out with surprising competence to help Claude finally liberate them from their corner of the battlefield. With all six of them together and the whole western side of the map cleared, they're in for a much easier time. At least for a while. Just in time for the weakest links to enter stage right. Now that may sound a bit rude and dismissive to Raphael, Marianne, and Lysithia. But I can't help it if that's how the truth comes across. Raphael was pretty decent early in the game, due to his great strength. But the fact that he is considerably worse at learning bow skills has held him back more recently. For that reason, I've excluded him from many recent missions in favor of Petra, Bernadetta, and Shamir. For that reason, he's also a bit underleveled, and therefore not very good. Marianne never had the advantage of strength, but has made the cut thus far, basically because we never managed to recruit Ash. Ultimately, while she doesn't hit hard, at least she has decent bow skills and has kept up level-wise due to the fact that I often use her low damage shots to finish off enemies, which nets a decent bit of experience, as it turns out. I'm still holding out hope that she might blossom into a more useful unit in the war phase, but honestly, she'll probably get taken off the main squad pretty soon in favor of Felix once his bow training takes hold a bit better. And then there's Lysithia who was basically a worse Marianne until she became a dancer. Unfortunately, the reason she's useful now is because on most turns, she effectively acts as a second Claude or Byleth. Occasionally, Leonie or Shamir. As it stands right now, acting as a second Raphael or Marianne is a considerably less enticing prospect. Let's just be glad that they entered the battlefield in a relatively safe area where they can take pot shots at our foes without really being in danger themselves. That should keep them from being deadweight, at least. And honestly, by this point in the mission, all of the tools were in place for a relatively painless finale. After catching up with my comrades, including some quite surprising character development from Marianne, it's time to defend the monastery yet again. The turn-to-turn -turn tactics here proved to be quite challenging. I had the most success with a highly defensive approach. These enemies were actively assaulting our position, so in general, I tried to keep the main force just out of the range before raining a hail of arrows upon them, when they, you know, stepped closer to us. That was the state of play on the Western Front, anyways. The Eastern Front was a different beast entirely. Here, Byleth, Leone, and Lorenz had to guide an allied soldier southward so he could effectuate one of Claude's schemes. There was just one problem. This allied soldier seemingly had no self-preservation instinct whatsoever. I had to waste some of Byleth's turns just shoving the poor sap out of harm's way. The key at this particular pivotal moment of the battlefield was shoving him not backwards, but rather to the side to prevent Byleth from attracting the attention of all of the enemy units on this side of the battlefield. It did actually turn out pretty alright though, because that lured the enemies out into positions where Leone, Lawrence, and Byleth could all work on taking them out. Then once that ally made it to his destination, he turned the remaining battlefield into a total hellscape. Unfortunately, Claude was the only flying unit I had, so in theory, all the fire was about as negative an effect for me as it was for the enemy. But in spite of that logic, it did cause the enemy to turn tail and flee, thus winning us the battle. Next, we face the Valley of Torments. As for our approach to this battle, we had Claude pull off some fun maneuvers with his wyvern, while most of the rest of the army steadily advanced up the western side of the map. Things were looking fairly promising when Wendell started advancing towards our defensive position, and then he gave up the pursuit in favor of hunting down our ally Judith. This was uh, problematic, as Judith definitely required reinforcements to survive, but our army was positioned too far away from her to conceivably reach her in time. Luckily, Claude was able to fly across the lava, intercept Gwendol, and fell the commander just in the nick of time. One nice thing about the battle is that we were able to finally recruit Ash during it. And, well... I did say that Marianne was probably only barely hanging on to her spot due to the fact that we hadn't recruited Ash during the school year. But things are different now. For starters, Ash is honestly a somewhat middling archer. Had I taught him at the academy, I'm sure he would have turned out much better. But alas, I was not able to, so now we are left with this poor specimen of a human being. 
But also, Marianne is on track to become a Bow Knight fairly soon. Additionally, a lot of our other units will start mounting up in the near future, which will finally make Marianne's special ability useful. Her ability Animal Friend actually lets her heal herself when adjacent to a friendly mounted unit. A welcome ability on a team without any healing magic, which is about to have a load of horses. And the cherry on top is the fact that Marianne has finally found a bow which plays to her strengths. The magic bow. This is a bow that deals magic damage and bases its attack strength on a character's magic stat instead of their strength stat. So not only is it more effective in Marianne's hands, but it's also just about our best weapon to use against armored units. So yeah, post time skip Marianne has quickly cemented herself as an integral part of the army. Speaking of integral parts of the army, Lysithia has gotten herself a decent upgrade. I gave her an item to permanently buff her movement stat. I figure having our dancer be so mobile could only be beneficial, especially since most of the rest of our units were on track to become cavalry pretty soon. And speaking of cavalry, before assaulting the Great Bridge of Merton, I certified myself and Leone as our army's very first bow knights. And really, it's an amazing class. You have great range with your archery, great movement, and can to. This is an ability that cavalry and flying units generally have, which allow them to use their remaining movement after taking an action. This enables us to use a great tactic where we move into an enemy's range, snipe at them, then move safely out of the range within the course of a single turn. Basically Mongol strats, and I'm here for it. The opening of the battle ends up being split between two major goals, taking this fort in the middle to stem the tide of enemy reinforcements, while simultaneously trying to avoid being routed by Lord Acheron's surprise attack. Claude, Bionth, and Lysithia pulled off the delicate feat of disarming the fort with the use of their mobility, hard-hitting strikes, and some careful positioning. Meanwhile, the rest of the force made use of gambits to control the ambushing enemies to the east. It's a tried and true strategy. Kill the enemies you can, and stall the ones you can't. And I'll note, Marianne's magic bow was of great use in ridding ourselves of the armored units involved in this attack. After dealing with those issues, I was able to steadily bring the full might of the army to bear against Ladislava and her monsters, thus bringing the battle to a smooth victory. The next battle was at Grander Field, a reprise of the Battle of the Eagle and Lion. My troops started in the north, a quite advantageous position strategically speaking. The source of that advantage was this river with limited crossings. As a troop of archers, we were able to position Leone, our best unit at taking a hit, at one of those crossings, bottlenecking the attacks of our foes while allowing our archers to take safe shots at them from across the river. The situation got even better when Imperial and Kingdom forces both reached the choke point and started attacking each other as well. Dimitri did attempt to break our formation by personally flanking us after he'd crossed another bridge upstream, but Claude was able to fly out and intercept him before he met the main body of our force. Once our foes' attack on our position had it fizzled out, we advanced southward without much resistance. Until we got to the last woman standing of the Imperial Force, Edelgard. And let me tell you, she shocked all by basically getting play of the game. Play of the game. All I can say is thank Sothis for Divine Pulse and Critical Hits. The next thing to do is push further into the Empire by taking Fort Mercius. I made sure to bring Sedith along for this mission. His bow skills aren't amazing, but flying over the walls of forts has always proved to be a pretty good strategy. And indeed, while Bioth, Marianne, and the others made slow and steady progress against the soldiers defending the Death Knight's position, Sedith was able to foreclose the enemy's ability to get reinforcements with some flight shenanigans before taking control of a siege weapon. Meanwhile, Claude and some allies he'd convinced to join the attack fought against the enemies held up in the north. Claude, being a flying unit himself, was able to manage to preserve his life while reinforcements led by Leone cut a path to meet up with him. But they never arrived. The Death Knight started to get active, beginning to flee while his guard lashed out at the reinforcements. Luckily, Leone and her force were able to hold up in a defensive position and avoid being crushed. But the Death Knight's flight was quick, too quick for Bioth and his force to catch up to him. And so it was left up to Claude to single-handedly cut off the Death Knight's retreat. 
and with a critical hit, he managed it. As we were gearing up for the next step of the invasion, some jerk accused my sweet Marianne of secretly being a monstrous beast, murdering people out in the forest. Yeah, we'll see if he sticks to that theory once we present him with the monster's head. And so, the paralogue to clear Marianne's name began. For those of you unfamiliar, paralogues in Fire Emblem are basically side quests, and you may have noticed that this is the first one I've so much as mentioned. That's because, uh, well, look at how long this video already is when we're just covering the main missions. And as such, I don't really have the time to go into paralogues. Which is really quite a shame, because the paralogues were actually some of the most interesting missions in the whole game. But not to worry, because I actually made a video going over all of the paralogues in this challenge. Which is a Patreon exclusive. So, if you want to see how I cleared Marianne's name, defended this fort, and completed all manner of side missions, feel free to join my Patreon at any tier. Yes, even the $1 tier, to get access to that video. But for now, let's get back to invading the Empire. Finally, it was time to bring the fight to Enba, the Imperial capital. Although before we face the battle, I'd like to highlight a new piece of gear we've acquired, the Shield of Seros. I had Leone wield the shield, which greatly reduces incoming damage from monsters. So now Leone is our go-to monster antagonizer, which she's quite good at. Now as for the battle, it starts with your forces separated and encourages you to rush. This is a trap. I tried advancing with each group in their own front of the battle, but I couldn't actually figure out a way to do so successfully. No, what you want to do is pivot the northern group around to help the other force effectuate a pincer maneuver across the eastern side of the city. We do have to contend with the enemy reinforcements as we push through the city, but luckily, they're mostly flying units, which are pretty easy to neutralize for obvious reasons. Then it's into the palace, where those long-distance heavy arms are as annoying as ever. They usually aren't huge powerhouses, but the mere fact that they can strike so far afield often means that they get teed up perfectly to land a finishing blow, especially if you ever find yourself in the range of two simultaneously. Now, I was going to thoroughly eliminate the forces on each side of the palace, in turn, before moving into the throne room to face Edelgard. But then suddenly, Dudu charged into the throne room all Leroy Jenkins style, and I figured, I could just leave the poor man to die. And so, ill-prepared, Claude and Leone assaulted the throne room. Luckily, Edelgard's guards uh, were quite distracted by Dudu, so distracted that they let Claude slip past all of them, straight to the Emperor herself, where he beat the odds and struck her down with a critical hit. But even with Edelgard's demise, the war wasn't over yet. For those who slither in the dark remained held up in the city without light. Our force surrounded the city, attacking from all directions. Claude, Bernadette, and Ignatz from the northwest, Leone, Hilda, and Lysithia from the northeast, Lauren, Shamir, and Petra from the southwest, and Byleth, Seteth, and Marianne from the southeast. We started by clearing all the enemies from the perimeter. While this was going on, Leone antagonized a nearby Titanus, which she defeated more or less single-handedly. This action seemed to have gotten the attention of a clear majority of the defenders inside the city. They attacked Leone's position, but not before my, by this point, extremely mobile force of predominantly cavalry archers swung around to reinforce the position as we bottlenecked the opposing force on the stairs. We rained arrows upon them until they were like pincushions. The innermost portion of the city was protected by unmanned automatic arms. Very annoying indeed. Though not as annoying as Tale's insane attack that damages seemingly everyone when he uses it. Fine, we'll sneak around the other way and ensure the whole exterior area is clear before we try entering his domain. Good plan, I'd say. If you don't consider the infinitely reinforcing titanuses, which kind of stopped that from being even remotely plausible. So yeah, pretty bad plan then. Not only were they difficult to kill, they were also quite tough to maneuver around. I tried going back around the other way, when their blockade on the west side became obviously unbreakable, but to be honest, I didn't even think it would help. There was no way we were breaking through this many titanuses. In an act of desperation, Byleth opened the door to Talos' chamber, hoping to give Claude a chance of pulling off one of those critical hits he was so good at. But Byleth was blocking the space which Claude needed to be on for Talos to be in his range. And so, death awaited. Or did it? See, the thing is, opening the door up front allowed for Talis to be shot from behind, where the rest of the army just so happened to be stationed. 
And even better, this guy's counterattacks actually had a limited range for once. So one by one, my archers took their shots, with Marianne landing the lethal blow. And with that, was the war over? Nay, for Nemesis rose from the dead, and Frodon would not see peace until we put him down yet again on the field of battle. The battle began in a precarious position. My forces were positioned behind a forest which would slow an enemy advance, which was sure to come from all sides. The trick was using our patented cavalry archer tactics of firing upon our foes and then galloping out of range, or at the very least control where we remained in range and in whose range we remained. Through such tactics, as well as Leone's amazing competence at slaying monsters, and a bit of gambiting to further control enemy movement, we successfully repelled the first wave of Nemesis attack. With our position secured, it was time to plan our offensive. Specifically, one which would kill all ten resurrected elites, which granted Nemesis extra power thanks to their existence. Two main obstacles made this task tougher than might be desired. A swamp, which was poisonous to our units, but not our enemies, and a ballista and onager, ready to strike down anyone who came too close. Claude and Lysithia were able to neutralize at least one set of arms, while the rest of the force advanced on the other sets with Marianne surviving an encounter with Daphne unscathed. In short order, we had taken the Blista as well. And now that we controlled them, oh boy, did things get fun. Claude, Sedith, and Petra, our flying units, wielded the arms and generally cleaned up the swamp, along with Lysithia and Leone, while the rest of the force hugged the southern coast in a march towards Nemesis. In short order, Nemesis stood alone before the full might of my army. But if there was one who could stand alone, and perhaps still prevail, it was him. He could counterattack from any range and with furious might. Not just that, but all of our units could only deal pitiful damage to him. This, while one hit from him, could kill just about any of them. The only way I figured we could win was if Claude managed to land two critical hits in a row. What were the odds of that? Quite low, as it turns out. But one fortunate thing was that Bernadetta wielded a killer bow, which gave her just about the same critical hit chance as Claude. Now you may be wondering why this is relevant. Well, this is why. I had Bernadetta attack a nearby knight who she landed four hits on thanks to her crest of Indec. They all did zero damage, but here's the important thing. There were two critical hits in her volley of shots. One as her first, and one as her fourth. This is important because of how Divine Pulse works. When you use Divine Pulse, the game does not reroll the probabilities of your attacks hit and crit chances. It's instead deterministic. But that determinism is tied to the order of the attacks, not the specific attacks themselves. Basically, since we now know which of the next four attacks will crit on a 30% chance, which is slightly worse than Claude's odds, we can Divine Pulse back to before Bernadetta's turn and act accordingly. We have Claude attack immediately, landing a critical hit just like expected. Nemesis counterattacks and misses. That's two attacks down. We need one more attack before Claude attacks again. To this end, Petra uses a gambit. Now the next attack will be the fourth, so after Lysithia dances for him, Claude lands the final critical bow on Nemesis, finally and truly ending the war. Finally, Fodlin and the greater world has peace. Claude ended up marrying Petra, fostering close ties between Brigid and Almira. And as for Byleth, he became king of a united Fodlin with a woman by his side who he'd grown to have a great respect for as they fought together in the War of Fodlin Unification. I've been considering what would be the best course for my future, and... Well, here, please, won't you take this? And there you go. Now you can argue in the comments at who Byleth actually should have ended up with. But as for the point of this video, yes, it is possible to eat Fire Emblem three houses while only using bows. Yes, even on Maddening Difficulty. I'm sorry this video took so long to come out, uh, but I do hope it was worth the wait. And do remember, if all this wasn't enough, you can check out how the paralogs went if you become a patron, like these fine individuals on screen, especially the $15 tier patrons, Enigmatic Mr. L and Ashburn Says. Or, if even that isn't enough Fire Emblem content for you, you can check out my Let's Play channel, where I'm currently playing Fire Emblem Engage. Additionally, if you're interested in watching more challenge videos like this one, then there's a wealth of them for you to enjoy on this channel, including my axes-only challenge on Fire Emblem Three Houses. Though, you'll have to excuse the audio quality on that one, 
it's a pretty old video at this point. But do have a look around and maybe consider subscribing while you're at it. And lastly, you probably like tactical RPGs if you watch this whole video. But if you also like lighthearted tabletop RPGs, you may want to check out the card based RPG I designed, Time Travel Entertainment Incorporated from Button Shy Games. But, anyways, guys, until next time, I've been Simicraft, considering returning to another challenge in the near future. Goodbye.